And with, with that, uh, having uh, accused the panel of being pretty darn good rather than me read introductions, they can introduce themselves better and more personally than I possibly could. So to my left, Denise, you're on. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. I'm Denise Manker. I work at Bear Crop Science in our biologics division. And uh, I have a background originally as a natural products chemist working on compounds from organisms, natural microbes. And I started in this field 32 years ago. So I've been dedicating my entire career to thinking about ways we can develop products that can really help us move more towards more sustainable farming. Mr. Cameron. Good morning, good to see everyone here. Um, Don, I'm Don Cameron and I farm uh, about 30 miles southwest of Fresno. Um, been farming for over 40 years, hate to say that, but, uh, and really started organic farming uh, 30 years ago. So we've been doing this a long time. We're a very diverse operation. We farm over uh, 20, 25 different crops, um, both organic and conventionally, and uh, have a lot of, uh, a lot of pressures put on us as, as all of the growers uh, in the room know. So. Pam may need no introduction, <laughs> but we're going to go ahead and have her do it. Well, a little factoid, uh, Denise said she started 32 years ago in biologicals. She started with the, the first company I started up, Entotech, in Davis 32 years ago as head of our R&D. Yeah, and then AgriQuest, I started up AgriQuest, and Denise came to AgriQuest, and then it was bought by Bayer, and Bayer, she went to Bayer, that's how she ended up with Bayer. And my third company, Marone Bio Innovations, was sold to BioSeries Crop Solutions on July 12th, and now I'm advising many different startups as well as doing another one, fourth startup, and it's called the Invasive Species Corporation, dedicated to uh, bringing biologicals to control serious um, invasive problems, not just in ag, but also in water and in forestry. Well, that's, that sounds like things have come full circle for you two. So, <laughs> we'll, uh, uh, so with, with that in mind, and, uh, and Pam, I'll, I'll leave it with you to start, start out. A very, a very simple question. Why less chemistry and more biology? Well, there's many reasons. First, number one, because when you incorporate biologicals into the program, you can see better return on investment. Number two, you can improve soil health, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve biodiversity, manage your residues, and, and manage uh, resistance uh, to, to other uh, products. And so there's a whole litany of reasons why, well, not to mention the pressure from the food channel and consumers on uh, less chemistry. So uh, there's a whole number of reasons. Biologicals are growing at double digits. Chemicals are growing at single digits. If you do the math, in 20 years, the biologicals market size will exceed the chemical size. Indeed, this morning it was announced that Corteva bought Stoller, which for one, somewhere over one billion, which is a, a biostimulant company um, that's been a, a, around a long time. So, you know, big guys are getting into this as well. Okay. Dom, what about your, your perspective from on the farm? Uh, so really on the farm, I, I look back and, you know, I, I was in one of the earlier sessions and the talk was about change and change in regulatory issues and the, being scared about that. My, my position has always been change is what we're about in farming. We are constantly changing. I see where we've been in the past, where we are today, and really down the road, I know we're going to see more change and more innovation, we're going to see softer chemistry, we're going to see better solutions for pest management, disease management. Um, we're going to see more scientific development that's going to be implemented on farm, that's going to not only affect our workers, our community, but uh, the, the people that consume our food. I think that uh, I think there's a real benefit for, for everyone as we move forward. Okay. Denise, how about you? Yeah, I think from the perspective of, you know, I kind of told you about my passion about wanting to have more sustainable agriculture, but, you know, Pam mentioned the business aspect, and I work now for the past 10 years for Bayer Crop Science that has a very large chemical division and a small biologics division, but they absolutely see the writing on the wall. They've invested almost probably a billion over time into this area, and they see due to regulatory pressures, you know, we're, we don't have options in Europe now. I mean, it's really changing around the world, and this is the future. We need to accelerate that, move towards that future, and so from our perspective, I mean, I have a personal interest, but from Bear Crop Science perspective, 
this is going to be part of the future and we need to move in that direction and we need to invest in that. Well, the, the future is generally perceived, well, I don't know if these days you can say it, but generally when you think about the future, you certainly want to do it with hope and optimism. Uh, so biologicals are the future, though I'm, I'm going to guess, and you've mentioned, uh, you know, without, without any uh, uh, comment on, on, on age and longevity and career, biologicals are not new. So, so and obviously there's regulatory, but what, what are the challenges is this, Either this development occurs or th this transition occurs from your mind since you've been lo looking at uh, yeah. you know, new products uh, for, for a long time. Yeah, I, I think some of the challenges remain the same, but we're getting better. So for example, improving efficacy and making sure we're getting up to give tools to growers that can really allow them to manage their costs and manage the, the challenges that they have. So that's something that we're continuing to move towards. We have a new strategy which is working with lots of of small research companies to come up with all the best solutions so we have a, a whole lot of products that can help growers. Um, I think, you know, as we learn more and technology improves, we can get costs down as well because making biologicals is a more expensive process than you know, synthetic chemistry. Um, and so I think some of the technical challenges, we've had gains over it. We didn't have genomics when I started doing this. We didn't have a lot of understanding about modes of action. And there's been a lot of progress in that area, and that helps growers be successful to know how to use the products. Okay. Don, t t question for you, and I kind of want to preface it with, I was, I was visiting with a grower the other day just about this, this topic in general, and they made the comment, we, we really don't know um, what the starting line looks like that if biologicals are, how do we evaluate it, how do we know, because we know they've been around. There's a rumor that sometimes growers think they don't limit it to just biology or, they kept, you know, everything's snake oil. So how, if, if you were giving some advice to the growers uh, in terms of like, how do they get a baseline coupled with what do you see the challenges? So as a, as a grower of both conventional and organic uh, food, you know, we have cha different challenges. Um, when we look at the organic side, we have a difficult time finding products that will really take care of the issues we have. Um, we've lost crops over the years um, because we, we weren't able to treat certain disease pests or, or pest problems. You know, and on the conventional side, um, we've, had, we've had people coming to us and uh, wanting us to try their products over the years. And, and many times they really weren't effective. And I think biologicals tended to get a, 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 they kind of got a bad name, I think, with growers because they weren't as effective. Or they, you know, we, we had to refrigerate a product or it, it made certain product really difficult to use and be effective in the field. Um, but I think we're gonna see some major changes. And, uh, and I look to where what we see uh, the pressures that we're going to see in conventional production with traditional uh, pesticide usage is going to change and it's going to allow growers to innovate to new products that will be extremely beneficial not only to the, tr the conventional grower but to the organic grower as well because all of the, there's going to be many products that are going to be able to be used in both conventional and organic and fill a niche that uh, we really haven't seen in the uh, field in the past. Okay, Pam, you know, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, very, very impressive, you know, not, company one, company two, company three. I, I mean, you've, you've built companies around um, um, dealing with the challenges. And, I, and so I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what the challenges were as you did that, but, but also pick up a, a little bit on, on that idea, because at the end of the day, there's a customer at the other end of all yep. this, and, yep. and 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 again, if if your growers, where, where do they start? If you know, if there's a new world coming, and I've haven't you know um, made up my mind, or I don't know how to get a baseline on this. Yeah. What's your advice to growers on that? And then talk about the challenges of building a company in this area. Well, I've, I've looked at three grower surveys recently, one in vegetables, one fruit, and one uh, row crops. And they all are very similar in that about 40% or so say, we don't even know how to use them. We don't, we're not actually aware of all the products that are out there and registered. So that number one is education and awareness. And that's really important. And that's 
what you have to focus on to get adoption. And then um, number two is, um, is we don't know how to actually integrate them in and based on their modes of action. And that's the key, is that there's a huge educational component. So some of the products that my companies have developed um, don't kill right away. They might take seven days. And, and, but when you incorporate these products into the programs with other tools, the whole program is better. And so the problem is often that uh, you, the, the, the researchers, university researchers, which you need this kind of data, standalone you know, trials against the best chemical cocktail, but that only goes so far. Because the benefits of biologicals are beyond just the number of dead bugs, you have to look at marketable yield. Because sometimes the biopesticide will stop feeding the bug will still be there, but if you counted dead bugs, it would look as a failure. But then when you look at marketable yield and quality, they shine. So that's why return on investment is a better measure. So the real key in getting adoption to the companies that I've started was going on the farm, doing demonstrations with key um, early adopter growers, like these guys, kind of guys, um, and doing a block and showing what, what your product does incorporated into the standard program. And um, I'll tell you a story. So I was at the Sustainable Ag Expo a couple weeks ago, and one of the researchers was presenting, and they said there was widespread resistance to all chemical classes uh, on the Central Coast to powdery mildew and, and botrytis. And so, um, so I said, well, are you going to incorporate in biologicals? Because they have, uh, you know, the modes of actions are such that, that uh, they, resistance is a very low chance of happening. So you could really delay the resistance and stop resistance by incorporating biologicals. And the answer was, well, I haven't tested them. Um, I've got some money from CDFA, so come back to me in three years. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. And all the growers were like, wait, wait, wait a minute. We have a serious problem right now. If you wait three years, only the, the resistance is going to advance, and the products, you'll, they'll get product failures, more product failures. So that on-farm um, on farm vetting and testing is really critical. And here is a point where I will mention that this group is working with Dennis on a Western Growers-led initiative to do that very on-farm vetting with the, the, a whole new crop of biologicals. And what we're seeing is an amazing set of new innovations. And as Denise said, the products are getting so much better as time goes on. And we're figuring out how to tweak Serenade, which we discovered, been around a long time. But you just tweaked it again and came up with a new version. So you can keep improving and improving because these are living things. Yeah, often. Okay. Well, yeah. Don, I'll let you pick up on, uh, as, sure. as a grower, what, what we're, we're up to. Uh, th though, uh, though I do want to put in the parking lot real quickly, uh, we've talked talking about challenges. Opportunities are going to be there. But based on what you just said, some of the opportunities are not, not chemistry versus biologists like no one solved this one. Exactly. And, oh, exactly. And so and exactly. so let, I want yeah. you to yeah. kind of address that where you see that, Don. Right. And so uh, as Pam uh, brought up, we uh, put together a, a working group. Uh, we now have funding from Western Growers and the Almond Board to move forward with trials of biologicals uh, starting in 2023. And these are going to be on-farm uh, on farm trials with uh, growers and uh, we're going we're gonna to start trialing some of these products that are out there and uh, check effectiveness and, uh, and, and really Share see, what, the see, how, see how it looks. And, uh, because I think that's been lacking. And, and as, as I said, growers are really not real familiar with biologicals. And to get them in the hands of growers, put them in, in real life situations and see how they do. And, uh, and, and move forward. Well, before we get to our product development guru, st st stay with a little bit uh, where they're just playing gaps. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I'm, uh, you know, chemistry versus biology. I'm, I'm pretty sure we, that's not addressing INSV as well as any of us would like. Wh where, where are the big gaps also? From, so, which means it's an opportunity for somebody or something. Look, we, we know that uh, we have resistance buildup with many products that we use. Um, I, I just think the door's wide open. Um, there's, there's many areas that we see. Um, I mean, a, a, any of the organic uh, grape growers know that powdery mildew is a, as Pam mentioned, it's a constant problem um, uh, for conventional and organic growers. Uh, you know, if you're an organic grower, you're out there with sulfur every week. If you miss a, 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 a day, you get behind the curve. And, uh, you know, how are you gonna rescue uh, the crop? So 
I, I think a lot of growers have been reluctant to move in that direction because they're, they're afraid that it may not work, they may lose the crop, and uh, they, they want to remain economically viable. And so I, I think there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of, there are a lot of gaps out there in, in areas, uh, especially in some of the minor crops. Uh, we see, look, we're always seeing new pests coming in, into uh, California and into our crops. And uh, I mean, I, I've grown crops where there was absolutely nothing registered on them. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're left to your luck, yeah. so. You, you know, I was, um I was advising one company, um, a startup, and they, as part of their National Science Foundation grant, they had to talk to 100 customers. And it was pretty remarkable when, some were organic, but most were conventional or both. And they said, well, we use chemicals, but we have, still have all these unmet needs. Fusarium, tomato, leafy greens, berries. Um, all, the, all the foliar diseases in berries, and then you know, grape powdery mildew. And, I, and I, was I, was, I was surprised because you always hear, you know, biologicals get a bad rap, and, and then you hear that, you, know, you, you think that chemicals work all the time, and they're always filling. You know, they're, 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 they're out there for, for everyone. Well, no, there's, there's still, uh, oh, thrips, thrips because of pest resistance. So there's so many needs that we heard that still need to be filled. So that's an opportunity for, for both. Yeah. So Dees, you, you've lived in both worlds, you know, the entrepreneurial world and now the, the corporate world. Huh? And, and you mentioned, right, you know, kind of right from the get-go that, you know, biologicals used to be this part of the portfolio and, you know, chemistry much, much bigger. Where, where do you see opportunities? Because obviously you're implying from your perspective that percentage of the pie chart is about to change. Well, I think um, something that I heard in the last session that was in this room was at the very top of every single list was there's a problem with weeds and controlling yes, weeds for the organic I've sector. That <laughs> and that is a really difficult yeah. nut to crack. I mean, that's really something where we have not been able to come up with a, a, a biological product that can work across a lot of different. So that's a big opportunity, but it's also a huge challenge. Um, I think other areas that we are thinking a lot about and putting effort and time into is things like thrips and other soft-bodied insects that need some new tools. Um, we are developing some things in Europe that we hope we'll be able to bring over to the U.S. as well that will be organic registered. Um, and then there are these new challenges, as Don mentioned, and you also, viruses. So we have a number of different areas to look for new sectors where we can try to solve some problems. Let, let me pick up on and bring things over from, from your uh, comment. Does what looks promising or is working in Europe, uh, you know, on a particular crop, uh, does that automatically transfer to we get it into California or do you just, you still have to play with the formula a little bit. Um, generally, our formulations have worked worldwide. Okay. So we haven't had to do too much specialization. Where I see some specialization happening is more around biological seed treatments, soil types around the world. Those are places where we maybe have to. But if we're talking about foliar and you know treatments or maybe soil pathogen treatments, those formulations have worked pretty well. The regulatory piece is another issue, okay. you know, like, uh. do you have the right package? And this was the other <laughs> session I missed this morning, but while I was in here. But I think that there's that, and then there's just the, the marketing piece, you know, how do we get the, the organizations interested in a market that's big enough for them to, you know, go forward and, and, and service that. So, I mean, we are selling products mostly into conventional, but our organic registered products are obviously available for organic growers, and I think there we could tighten up and do better. So I'm looking around the room real quickly. Everyone is sold on biologicals are coming, and they want, you know, <laughs> and, and, and they'll want to know where to get some. I think there's 40% there, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> that, that, that leaves. But so everyone's Higher excited. Version. The future's coming. Pick up on the regulatory piece, because I, I, think, I think in terms of, and I want to do it in the context of, Okay, what does adoption really look like and consist of, and how do you then begin to know what you know that, that you feel com com comfortable with this? And this and this regulatory piece, in terms of managing expectations, is uh, you know how, how long does it take to run the gauntlet? Because you know, Pam, like you mentioned at the conference you're at, you know, uh, uh, you know, I think most most of us kind of feel like we're drinking from a fire hose these days, and we need answers now, and the regulatory process can really slow things down. So so what does adoption look like and what are all the elements besides I like it? 
Well, as I mentioned, um, uh, there, there's, there's, you have to, a company that has a new product has to come in with good, good solid field data, standalone. And, but then that's not the end of the story. You have to have integrated into the program how they're in real life use. So those grower demos are nothing better than, than the grower demos to gain adoption. And, but on the regulatory side, um, the U.S. has slowed down and Brazil has speeded up. In the last nine years, Brazil has registered more biologicals than the U.S. has in total in, in 30, 30 plus years. So, so we need to get back on track with the U.S. EPA. There are a number of initiatives for Cal DPR to get to speed up. Uh, Don and I are both on the Sustainable Pest Management Working Group, and we have a whole number of, quite a lot of recommendations for if you're, if you're going to, California, if you're going to take products off the market, then you better have those alternatives available. And they take, it takes too long to get them approved. So, and then Europe is just a big problem. <laughs> they, they're reducing chemicals, have eliminated hundreds of chemicals, and now have fertilizer reduction targets. But on the biopesticide side, it takes seven years to get to get a product through. So we have some regulatory challenges. If you're going to, the, 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 if you're going to ban chemicals, then you, you better then fix your regulatory system to accelerate the alternatives. But that's not happening in all cases. But Brazil it is. As a result, Brazil is doubling um, its uh, adoption of biologicals. And what was the secret there, speaking of adoption? The first adoption, the first trying of the biologicals, desperation because the pests were resistant, they needed alternatives. Um, was a failure because there wasn't that educational piece going on with it. So then when each state in Brazil provided uh, extension services and said, here is how you use these products and, and did a lot more hand-holding, there was much more rapid adoption. And that's a good lesson for us here. Yeah, yeah I, I also believe that you know, regula the, regu the regulatory system we have here has really slowed down the adoption of products. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've uh, those of us on the Sustainable Pest Management Task Force have made recommendations. Uh, and Scott Park, I know you're back there. You're on, on that too, task force yeah. as well. Um, and have been, we've been working on this for two years now, and it's we're we're down to the down to the wire. Last meeting on Friday. Friday, and uh, so we have a lot of recommendations in that roadmap that that will be announced uh, probably after the first of the year. But one of the recommendations we made was that DPR. Um, Shorten the time period that they that they go through, especially for uh, biologicals that that may not have the issues that a traditional the traditional chemistry has, um, so that we can get these products in the hands of growers and in the, in really in our hands, so we can trial some of these newer products um, to find solutions for for some of the the priority uh, pesticides that are going to be targeted in the near future. So. We we need a we need an arsenal. We're, the, but look, as as growers, we know these bugs, these diseases, they're not going to go away. Uh, matter of fact, we're going to have more. With the climate warming, we're going to see more rapid population explosions. We're going to see introductions of exotics. Um, we have a lot of issues, and we're going to need we're going to need something to to be able to use that's uh, that's going to be effective, and that growers can afford. That's going to work. So. Denise, what from a corporate vantage point, and you you also um, alluded to uh, how ba uh, how Bayer's doing things. You know, you're doing what you're doing, but n now also looking at a lot of smaller smaller companies and that sort of thing. So, um, what what are all of the uh, you know, just how how does that work in your world? You, you're working in the lab, and then who's who's looking at the other companies, and who's making those evaluations? That, that yeah. type of thing. So one of the things we're doing is kind of broadening our folk, our, our areas of products that we're that we're going to have in our portfolio. So we've been doing microbials for quite a long time. Now we're going to start incorporating also um, pheromones and plant extracts, and sort of broadening the different types of products that we can look at. But what we did, since we are no longer doing the internal discovery, um, we set up teams of people that are evaluating these companies. And a lot of this has to do with looking at data. What, what kind of data do these small companies, they may not have the resources to do a full commercial formulation or registration package or trials all over the world, but we can provide that. But if they have a certain level of data that's really you know believable in terms of their 
field trials, and I'm not talking about 10 years of data, but just something that looks reproducible, that's something we can start to work with. And I, I spent 10 years in charge of global field trials for biologicals, um, first at AgriQuest and then at Bayer. And one of the things Pam said is really key, which is that to get a registration, you have to have standalone data with a biological. And that is not how they perform well. You can get enough data that you can get a registration most of the time. But really, these products work in systems. That's and right. that's how a lot of growers think about the system. It's the system that works. And so until we put these products into integrated programs where we're using other tools and we're using the, the full capabilities of the biological, we're not going to see that. And that also goes, you know, Pam talked about people not having enough information about how to use them. We haven't had extension support that really focuses on these kind of products. And, and maybe there are some people coming up now, but in, over my career, you know, I've seen basically they're testing them as if they're synthetic systemic chemistry. That's and right. they don't work that way. That's and right. so this is why we need to have a different approach to supporting growers with extension, with programs that can test them in real conditions and show the value of the biological. Yep. Well, question. And you know, I, and Pam, you and I were visiting last night. I, I, I heard a phrase I like this, this whole issue of knowledge transfer, and uh, and you know, I, I'm, I think we're all glad to see. Uh, uh, we, we won't do a show of hands, but I'm assuming there's a few crop advisors here, uh, and and I've always been impressed by their continuing education ca capability. I, th I think that I think that's pretty impressive. So how how, how do we, uh, you know? prepare growers and, and prepare for, for the future What in terms of education and knowledge. What's, the, what's our best bet? Well, you know, it has been, um, as Denise mentioned, it, it's, it's been hard to engage the uh, extension uh, system to, to understand these products, but um, there are a lot of, as there's a cha generational shift, my generation <laughs> retires, uh, <laughs> there's a, a, a younger group coming in who are keen to adopt not only to, to look at biologicals and systems, but also tech. So incorporating um, smart traps and um, both spore traps and smart insect traps and other technologies, that all the digital tools, because you can use those, that tech to make biologicals better and better, and, and, and also spray, any kind of sprays, uh, uh, more accurate or reduction of sprays by timing your sprays much better, and that's key. And so, um, so I, you know, I, I think uh, um, it would be great to have Don talk about that. Yeah, no, well. I'd like your perspective yeah. on, on that, Don, and then and then also embellish upon it a little bit with, from this angle. Uh, so all the ag tech people in the room, I, I, and you're, and I know we're friends. I hope we are still after I say what I'm about to say. He tries everything. <laughs> uh, so it, yeah, yeah, see, people know well, there's see, a, there's it. kind of a no early so, adopter. Um, What's the, uh, the the tech play in, in all this in terms of s skills that you're going to see people having having to have? But uh, you know, he who needs to know what? And what's the best way to get there? So, you know, as a, we we do try a lot of different things. You, you do, uh, yes. We're still in business, so that's a good thing. <laughs> we have we have you know we don't do the whole farm. We just we we do a lot of trialing on farm ourselves. But uh, you know you, you're right. A lot of these, a lot of the farmers out there, they're never going to change, no matter what. We we know that. You know they're going to retire, and that'll be somebody else will fill their spot, and and they'll be more creative, I think. And I think they're going to be more open to new solutions. And I think that you know you've got to get it in the hands of growers. You have to, you, and you have to give them an education. I mean, you really have to have the technical assistance to go with these to make them work properly and look we're going to be we know we're headed toward toward limited uh, more limited pesticide use in the future and maybe that'll drive some of the growers to make the switch but you're going to see I think you're going to really see some of the universities I mean we, we've been proposing this that that there's additional training and support for yep. for not only but for UC extension, but for PCAs, right. be ready because it's coming. Yeah. Um, you're going to be required to do more. You're going to have, I assume, additional categories uh, coming forward. Um, 
But there's a lot in the works that's going to be out fairly soon. Uh, yeah, that was one of the recommendations we made of the work group was yeah. that both extension as well as uh, PCAs and CCAs get additional training in sustainable pest management. So that is coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Denise, from uh, um, your from your standpoint, and you know, we've heard about you know crop advisors, the uh, uh, the university system. Um, you know, the bayers of the world have the ability to go to market. So I, I presume part of what gets on the considered on the drawing board is okay. How how, how are we gonna how are we going to get to market, and who needs who needs to know what? What's the education process look like? Well, it's the same thing that we're talking about with growers, but it is internally for us. It you know when you start a business that is entirely chemical, and then you add biologicals to that, you have to do a lot of internal education. So I do a lot of technical advising, not just for distribution and growers, but also for my colleagues because they are different and they, they don't work the same way. So it, it is a process of, of education inside the big company as well as outside in order to see, we aren't used to running trials where we look at return on investment and what, what was the marketable yield. We're used to looking at trials, did it kill this pest? Right. And so ch shifting that mindset, and we are also really moving towards systems in the whole company. So what you talked about with the digital approaches, whether that's early disease detection or whether it's a more precise application, this is gonna be an important part of what we're creating to have value for growers, where we have digital tools, we have you know, different crop protection, and we also think about soil health and what kinds of products are we putting in to help plants. You know, you mentioned climate. We have, you know, severe stress now on plants that, that wasn't there before, and help. And we, we know that microbes can help uh, mitigate plant stress, in whether it's drought or too much water, or whether it's, you know, the d pH of the soil. There's a lot of different things we can do, but I think I mean, I don't know about the other big companies, but ours, and I see also in the liter in you know the press, we're thinking a lot more about systems and how yep. do we approach the entire farming system in a way that helps provide food for people and also be more sustainable to the land. Okay, I want to pick up on the systems thing in a, in a second. Go ahead, Don. No, I was just going to say the other thing. You know, when I look at the future in farming, um, I look at it as a, a much more integrated system with technology. You know, we're going to be looking at um, models that actually work and predict. that are much more predictive than they are now. Um, we're going to be able, uh, Pam mentioned it early, for timing of, of any type of sprays you're going to be doing. Um, we're going to be a lot smarter about how we uh, see insect populations, disease uh, populations, uh, or pressures increase um, in the future. We're going to have a much more integrated farm, and it's going to be it's going to be it require a lot of data, but not enough. I mean, you don't want to over you don't want to overload a grower with just data. You need results. You need actual. Uh, you, you you need the technology to work for you, not to work against you. Sure. Well, l l let me ask you a question. You you know you're talking about data and you 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 know you're ma you're managing things. Uh, on farm, and, and obviously the ag tech sector, there's a, there's a lot going on, but are we not there yet relative to pest, you know, pest pressures and disease in terms of analytic capabilities and data gathering? No, I, th I think uh, we have a long way to go. I think that the future is out there, and I think we can really, uh, I think we can integrate a lot of technology into uh, pest pressure, definitely disease pressure. Uh, to, where, to where we're farming smarter um, and we're more directed uh, for, the, for the problem. I mean, uh, e even in traditional chemistry now, we, we're much more targeted uh, than we ever used to be. And I, I think that's going to continue to evolve. I think we're going to be, we're going to be able to see if, if our pressure is increasing, but then climatic conditions change and, you know, maybe we can predict, we don't even need to put an application on. Um, and, and if we do, we'll be able to target it much more effectively um, and much more specifically to our need. So I, I, I just see we have a really bright future ahead. I think, I think products that uh, are coming in, you're, I, don't, I don't think growers are going to believe they're actually that great. Uh, they're going to be exceptional. Um, I, think, I think we have a really good future ahead for uh, sustainable farming. 
Okay. Pam, or, or I was go gonna, ahead. I was going to touch on something yeah. Denise said that about soil health. And it's really important concept. Everybody's pushing soil health. Organic growers are the have, have that's the whole basis for you. <laughs> You're pioneers way back in, in this, but now it's now it's a big thing in conventional farming as, as well. But I just mentioned about biologicals and soil health. We're getting a lot of data now to show that biologicals can change the uh, microbial composition in a positive way by improving the functional groups of microbes to help my, uh, plants take up uh, nutrients better, uh, to uh, water stress uh, issues, um, and, and all kinds of, of other uh, improved functionalities. And so, uh, because we can now uh, sequence the genes and, and companies like Biomakers and Trace Genomics, you can send off a sample and we can test the, the state of your farm soil as is and then before and after treatment of a product. So. It's going to be pretty standard that every company is going to have to uh, understand what their product does to the, the soil uh, biodiversity, and, and that, that's really exciting. Yeah. So if, if uh, whether it's grower shippers, processors, or individual growers, if they have to, um, you know, part of the social currency issues of the day, you know, uh, to, to keep it simple, the, the, the ESG agenda, regardless oh, yeah. of people's opinion, it, it sounds like this is pretty low-hanging fruit. This, exactly. this just contributes to that, exactly. you know, so yeah. why not take advantage of it? I wanted to, since you've, uh, since you've built a, a company or two and have hung around with the, the venture crowd, you know, from what we <laughs> see at the, uh, uh, at the center, the biological Biologics, the, those companies that come in, you know, there's a lot of venture activity there is. Uh, around around this space. What what are investors thinking about? Because I because I think growers, again, that whole idea, how long is it going to take either to get new products or promising products? There's regulatory, there's trial, um, and investors are clearly playing playing yeah, in the yeah, space. Yeah. What are, what are, what are they? What are they looking for, and how do they yeah. feel about things I right now? I talked to two venture capitalists yesterday, and uh, they, were, they were asking me my opinions on different, different companies with their different technologies. Interesting. They're very much into heavy tech, tech, tech uh, science. So, so they, and Denise can probably agree, you know, comment on this as well. They're, they're looking for something that is differentiated and is different from what's already out there, but has got a lot of science behind it and shows why the product works well. And, uh, and then they're looking for something that is, they, they don't always have to have field data, but having field data would be great. But I know some VCs that will take it with really good greenhouse data. So you have to have, as Denise said, you have to have to show it works. And they like platform companies. Um, uh, I've always developed product companies, but, <laughs> but I, they, well, I always had platforms too, but they like companies that, that have some scientific tool that can go into different applications. So they call those platform companies. So this can broad and, and, and be big. Yeah. Big is an interesting word. Some, sometimes the specialty crop crowd, we, we, we suffer from exactly. addressable market this size. This is very true. So, we're all, so we're, now we're really excited about biologicals, but? You know, my answer to the, to the VCs who, who all, want everything has to be corn and soybeans is, excuse me, but if you add up all the pesticides you, used in specialty crops today, it is the same size as the row crop market, okay? It's just that we're more frag, fragment, fragmented. And if you are a uh, venture capitalist, wouldn't, it's really hard to access those millions and millions, hundreds of millions of acres uh, of corn and soybeans. But you can get the, the, the biggest berry growers by talking to, to, to two or three people, you know, and in, in, in California. So why, why not start with specialty crops? So there is a crowd of VCs that is, is gravitating, but it's a tough road because they all like corn and soybeans. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, Bayer doesn't prefer corn and soybeans. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Jenny? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's lettuce and strawberries, yeah. right? <laughs> and organic, of course. Okay. How do, how, your perspective on this, Denise? Uh, I think it really is a challenge, but I mean, when we talk about feeding people, it's about horticulture, you know? I mean, that, and, and also the practices we need for producing food, this is where we need to be. And if we, we have a tagline that's, you know, health for all and hunger for none, horticulture's right there. It's important. And it is, you know, when, and I have the same conversations within our company. It's like, well, you know, you have corn and soy, but then the third biggest crop 
is horticulture. Okay. And that's huge, that's you know? Huge. So yes, it's fragmented, but it is a huge crop group and it's important to us and it's important to what we're doing for you know helping get food produced okay um so quick pause we're gonna leave a few minutes for questions so uh i am going but but i'm gonna give everyone a final word you know the proverbial hey you miss you should have asked or i've always wanted to say in front of a group like this uh i'll, I'll let each of them uh Clo closing comment, uh, just uh, kind of bringing it all together and then we'll open up. We'll have a few minutes for questions. So Pam, I'll, I'll start with you. What, what's important for everyone to take away from all this? The speed of change in the world and farming and everything is, is, go is, is moving so fast that traditional ways of doing things are not, are not the way it's going to be going forward. And, and there is rapid innovation and science being applied to the biologicals. So, it drives me crazy when I hear, well, I tested your product. And I said, when did you test it? And they said, well, like five years ago. Remember that uh, there's, there's a very different business model for biologicals than big chemicals. With chemicals, you spend $300 million up front, have thousands of field trials, and then launch it big. With biologicals, you launch your version 1.0 with some guy like this. And then he gives feedback, good or bad. And then uh, that goes back into the back into to developing the small company would then develop 2.0. And, and because we're often, often working with living microbials, you can constantly change the microbes. So you got to understand the different business model. Don't expect a, a new biological to have a thousand field trials, global field trials behind it, um, unless it's something that's been vetted by Bayer or you know an older product or something, or they vetted it. But but uh, uh, you know you you want to understand that that your first version may solve your problem that you have your thrips re, you know resistant thrips or something, but it's not going to be perfect. But it'll serve a need, and then just wait you know in a couple of years, it's about every two to three years you're going to have your your next version. Yeah. Don, your thoughts. Yeah, and, and honestly, I wasn't aware of this until I spoke to Pam, and I had tried things years ago, <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm never going to try them again. <laughs> so I guess the, the, the take-home message is, you know, be open, continue to try different products in different situations. Um, I'm organic and, and conventional, and I have learned so much from, from farming both ways. We, we integrate things from one side to the other all the time. Um, but just know that there are products that are going to be coming. Keep your mind open to them. Try them. And like I say, we're, we're going to be doing uh, trials on uh, the best looking products that we think are out there and hopefully continue this for, for many years and really start a program to where vetting will be uh, done and look, we all farm in different regions and uh, have different different uh, situations, um, but definitely uh, know that uh, we're headed in the right direction, and I think the, the future in California is great. So. Okay, Denise? I think we're on the cusp of a really new era for biologicals. You see all the big companies are involved and many, many small companies, and you know people realize that change is happening and we're going to approach this in a way that's going to be able to provide more tools faster. And we aren't going to have the model anymore that we have to have a thousand field trials, you know, for biologicals. We need to get out there and get products out there. And so relying on all different kinds of data to, to get there. So I think we're, we're really on an exciting point right now with biologicals. All right. That sounds good. Um, all right. I, 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 see, I see some hands. According, according to this program, which, which I read, <laughs> we, 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 well, I just looked at the pictures actually. Uh, we got, we got 10 minutes and, uh, you know, not, not a minute less or a minute more. So your hand was up first in the, in the back. And then I want to make sure though, before I call, can I have everyone, uh, thank the panel? I think they were, uh, I, I, uh, I think they exceeded pretty darn good. So uh, hopefully you learned a thing or two. Okay, got you in the back. Yes, sir. Sure, thank you for the discussion today. Just wondering if there are any, oh, how about that? Uh, I have a loud voice anyway. Norm, I didn't know that was you. I'm losing my sight. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Uh, just wondering if there are any concerns about the use of biologicals intersecting with food safety measures and whether or not that's contributing to the hesitancy of using biologicals? 
I mean, I think that, that I just had an email yesterday from some of our guys out in the field saying, okay, there's a new leafy green requirement for a certificate of analysis for microbial, you know, this kind of thing. So we're definitely aware of that. And yes, I think that because we're thinking about food safety everywhere and different things that can happen, we need to be able to have systems that differentiate good microbes, bad microbes, and we are, we are already on top of that with our manufacturing, but being, we are now getting that information across to suppliers, so that, yes, that's a concern, and it's something that we're aware of and definitely dealing with. But it's not, it's not like there, there are the microbes that are the biological pesticides or the biological stimulants that are, um, well, I wouldn't say, biopesticides are regulated by EPA, and we have to prove that there are no human pathogens in any of our products. That is not the case for biostimulants or bionutrients, okay? So you need to ask the manufacturer of those, have they tested for human pathogens in their product? I think that's really important because they're state regulated, they're not EPA regulated. But we as biopesticide companies, we, can, we have a, a, a stricter standard for human pathogen presence, and we can have zero, than actually chemical pesticides do. So. Okay. Yeah. Done anything or next next question? Yeah. Next question. Next question. All right. But We're, but no, that that is a concern. Yeah. Um, food safety and uh, you know what, with what we deliver, we have we have very tough standards so, uh, that we. I, I, I assume this is as analogous to when, when I was in the game, and then I'd get the memo from the processor: you can't use this anymore. Right. So, uh, you, as you know, okay. uh, you know we right. we get pesticide lists uh, from our from our uh, processors. Uh, every year. Okay. All right. Some of them are very yes, different. Sir. Yeah. Oh, oh, plus he's got the mic. Oh, there was one back. back here. Oh, okay. The mic's in the back. All right. Then you're next. Yeah. Then you. Um, to Pam, uh, yeah. do you think there's any value in moving away from the term traditional chemistry uh, with the connotation of we stick with that? And then a follow up question is that when do you think we should start talking about more of the chemistry related to biologicals? So those chemical elements of the biological products you know, talking about that rather than it smells like a bug, it looks like a bug, yeah. it's a bug. You know, that's a really good question because I spent my whole career, and Denise is a natural product chemist, focusing on natural product chemistry produced by microbes and plants. Yet, because it's easier to develop a living, in many ways to put a microbe on a seed or spray a microbe and not characterize the natural product chemistry produced by the microbes, the chemistry, the natural product chemistry has gotten short shrift. But indeed, one of the reasons why we were successful with the products that we developed is because we optimize that natural product chemistry in fermentation. And every batch we make has a specific level with an analytical chemistry method of that particular chemistry. Um, that's true of Serenade, that's true of Regalia, that's true of uh, Venerate, any of the products that we've developed. So, um, I think, I think natural product chemistry has gotten short shrift, um, but it's, it's really important. But the regulatory agencies love, li love the living microbes, and they treat the natural product chemistry as synthetic chemistry, even though it's totally different. It's very biodegradable. I've not, not, not developed a product with, chemi with any natural pr product chemi chemi chemicals that are as, as persistent as the tradition and traditional, and there's your word. I don't know, it's called conventional, traditional, whatever. Biopesticides is, is not a great name, and the industry's trying to change it to bioprotection, so I, you know, whatever you like to call it, I'm, I'm open for that. Are you responsible <laughs> for trying to change it to bioprotection? <laughs> not, not alone. Not no, yet. that's okay. the, the, uh, right. the bio, bio Products Industry Alliance and the uh, Association of the uh, uh, International Biocontrol Manufacturers Association. Those two are trying to change it to bioprotection. Got so it. I should start. Changing my language, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I think she covered it pretty All right. well. I have a question. <laughs> well, I didn't understand everything she said, okay, so okay. I'm going to take your word for it. So I, I, just, I just like hanging around with these people. Yeah, no, no. I, I learned so much. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I know I have the opportunity to learn a lot. I, like I said, I didn't understand everything they said. So, yeah, yes, sir. How much work is being done on parasitic insects? Oh, that's a huge area. Did everyone hear that? How much work is being done on parasitic insects? So I was just at the Association for Biocontrol Manufacturers meeting in Basel, Switzerland, and what was amazing is the companies, big companies like Copert and Biobest and others are actually selecting beneficial uh, predators and, and, and parasites and such to be better at, at controlling the, the pests. And they actually could shift one to become a better thrips controller. And then there was another one that Biobest won the best of show 
um, for the new product, they found a, 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 a but predator that, a mite, that ate powdery mildew at the same time it was eating the pest mites. So it got a twofer and uh, really cool. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty big segment. I would say about a half a billion dollars worth of uh, beneficial insects are sold globally. And I was at the, at, at the Sustainable Ag Show a couple weeks ago, and, and there's drone applications now, too. So hmm. this, is a, this is a very, uh, I, I didn't expect this, because it's not my thing, but because I've been focused more on the, the, the biopesticide side. But I, I'm amazed at what's really happening on the beneficial side, yeah, yeah. Okay. She yeah. got it, huh? She got it. She got it, all right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, she's, pass she's passing the test. All right, any other? We got five minutes. I see a hand. I'd, uh, I'd love to hear uh, your perspectives and insights on um, environmental and physical characteristics of um, on how they impact biological applications. Um, for example, um, you know, is it best to spray when it's warmer? Is it best to spray with less hard water, pH differences? These types of things that I think really need to expand in our knowledge. Um, as a manufacturer, um, it's something that I'm constantly learning and trying to adopt. But um, I'd love to hear your insights, if you have any. I think that's really, really key. And it's really on the manufacturers of these products to be looking at all of these different things because you are using them on the farm. You're going to have different kinds of water. You're going to have different kinds of all, all different conditions. It's really important for us to be vetting all that for you in terms of what can you tank mix with? What can you go, what, how are you going to use this? That's part of the education Pam was talking about that we need to provide so that the growers know how to be successful. And, this is gonna be different for different products because biologicals are so diverse. So you may have a living organism that can only stand certain, can't stand sunlight, has to be sprayed at night or something. But that's not the case for other products that are relying on some natural product chemistry. So it's really product dependent and it is really on the manufacturers to be sorting that out and providing that information to the growers. Really key. A lot key. of it is on the label. If you look and read the labels carefully, a lot of the manufacturers of biological do have a lot of that information, what it can or cannot be mixed with. Like you said, some, some bacteria like bacillus can be mixed with fungicides, but others and like copper. trichoderma might be more, or copper might be more sensitive. So you have to read that label. And how about you from a grower perspective? Yeah, uh, from a grower perspective, um, you know, if we, if we rely on somebody else to do the application, um, where, is get, where is getting, I mean, this guy made may say, I, I won't work at night, I, I only do this, and, or as a grower, we have a lot of acres we need to cover, what are we gonna do? You know, and we need to treat today, not over a seven day period. It, it's really complicated. Um, I mean, I was surveyed on a, on a product and I was asked, well, what if this product had to be refrigerated? Would you use it? And I said, no, um, we don't have the capability and our applicator doesn't have the capability. And, so you know the chain of getting it from the supplier to the grower to the applicator, it it it's it's a difficult process. And uh, you know I've seen guys take water out of a ditch and others mm -hmm. out of a yeah. well, and you <laughs> yeah. know it. So it's got to be a durable product that that has a hopefully a wider application. To your point, um, a lot of my, um, in my experience, uh, a lot of the issues that we found with uh, biological products is the applicator, and no offense to the applicators in the room, but uh, at the end of the day, most of the time when uh, our products are found ineffective, it has to do with the application. So as a grower, what are you doing to educate your applicators, and would it bring a lot of value for manufacturers because I know most applicators are Hispanic and speak very little English, would it bring more value as um, for a manufacturer to bring a Hispanic speaking or a Spanish speaking um, person in to train your applicators on our products? Or do you think that, you know, what's, what's the best uh, route um, for education in that manner? So, so I know on our firm, we have, most of our guys are bilingual um, and the Spanish only speakers, uh, are trained by them. And I think if you get, you don't have to have the bilingual, it's good. Um, but typically you, we, have, we have people that speak both English and Spanish and can translate 
very effectively. But you hit on something really important, and that is there's been a, ver a real paucity of har hardly any research on making biologicals work better through application. And if you look at right. some of your products, um, our products, that if, if, if the bug has to feed on and get a lethal dose feeding, but um, it's applied in such a way that there's big droplets over here and the bug can, can go in between and not get enough of that lethal dose, same for BT too, and a number of the biologicals, it's not great. So I think here's an area where technology can really help and new spray technology can really help and uh, a lot more work done on how to make them work with better spray. I just, I saw some data recently, and it was with chemicals. It was, oh yeah, it was at the Sustainable Ag Expo, how um, most of the time too much water is being applied, and, um, and when they reduced uh, uh, the water from 100 down to, to 50 gallons, it, the, the products were working much better. Yeah, and I think education of the PCAs that are making recommendations is gonna be extremely helpful, but really the grower's spending the money and if you tell him this product isn't going to work if you apply it in this manner, he'll, he'll change. Yeah. All right, we are officially into overtime. <laughs> so uh, uh, so what, I, what, I of, what I often tell people when we want to finish up, particularly when people want to sell things, is so you'll notice how many of you there are. You'll notice where they are. They can't get past you unless they go <laughs> through you. So if you want to... Uh, Grab them on the, on the way out. I'm, I'm sure they're happy to visit a little, a little further until we officially get kicked out of the room. Is there a morning break now? Uh, I, I think. Uh, or not? I, I think there is. So, so, uh, no, there is. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think there is. I'm, I'm not sure what comes behind in this room. So okay. I'll, I'll uh, let great, you accost them here. on the way out. And <laughs> yeah. Thanks Thank very you. much Thank for you. joining us. Yeah. Thanks.